Today I'm going to probe into live streaming and social media to see how teenage addicted to it and why it harming them in some ways. Live streaming is not a new toy that we got yesterday, actually. It has been round in one form or another since the 1990s. But with live streaming and social media is often the term used that describes the process of broadcasting real time. Live video footage or video feed to an audience accessing the video stream over the internet. The viewing device can be a desktop computer, laptop, tablet, smartphone or digital screen at home. And there are a lot of popular live streaming functions or apps on digital devices like the Meerkat, Periscope or even live streaming on Facebook which has almost 40% of internet teenager users participate in it. Take this chart by Deloitte illustrates the different media preferences of different generations in the United States as an example. It's quite easy to see younger people more favor in streaming services over traditional pay TV. So here comes the question, why did these familiar apps not quite make it into the mainstream just a year or two ago? One possible reason is the perfect storm of technology and accessibility. The population of high-quality smartphones with front-facing cameras have made it possible for users to shoot excellent live video from essentially anywhere. People no need to spend much more money to buy a professional cameras or any expensive editing software to use the technically skills to edit their videos. This overlap seems to have laid the groundwork for live streaming to explode in popularity after so many years of trying. In a New York Times interview, Chris Saka, founder and chairman of Lowercase Capital and an early investor in Twitter, summed it up perfectly, all of a sudden. The world's pockets are full of good cameras and good screens with good data plans and good social platforms to let everyone know you're broadcasting. Everyone can be the best host of their own talk show as well. Even with the convergence of technology and accessibility, there must be something more about how has it gained such incredible tendency in such a short period of time? To answer these questions, we need to look at the distinct benefits come with live streaming. The first one is it humanizes people in a way images and recorded video can't. Within the social media, what you see is what you get. Yet, and there are no second takes. We're ready for a bit of reality. We want to know that the people we are watching behind the screen are real, that they aren't perfect just like the rest of us. Another one is it allows us to participate in something bigger than ourselves. In the past, we read about or watched those events after they happened. There was a certain significance of community knowing that millions of people had read about or watched the same announcements or events. Social media is fascinating because it allows teenagers to interact with one another while they are in separate places. This is never clearer than on a Friday night. As media scholar Dana Boyd claimed that, social media enables teenagers to escape the confines of strict parenting and form communities with friends on their own terms. When parents deny their children the opportunity to go out with their friends, teenagers lock themselves in their bedrooms, log on to the virtual world, and establish a presence on social media. In 2005, James Johnson and Hideki Kishioka founded Stick'em, the first live streaming social network. Over the 10 million members on Stick'em until it had shut down in 2013 were all teenagers whose parents wouldn't let them go out with their friends. But here comes the problem. The basic one is the teenagers obsessed and couldn't stop looking at their phones or digital devices. There are studies showing that kids now are less able to have a conversation and make eye contact. The next one is it becomes the perfect forum for cyberbullying and harassment. Within the teenagers most witnessed reactions to cruelty and meanness on social media websites in 2011. The statistic shows frequently observed reactions to cyberbullying on social networking sites which 27% of teenage respondents who have seen others being mean and cruel have also witnessed. Others defending the victim who was being harassed. Teenagers make conscious decisions to use social media live streaming websites to interact with one another. And these interactions sometimes become immoral. However, no one is forcing them to do this. And what role should parents or guardians have and what role should be left to teenagers? Shutting down the websites or confiscate their phones is only a greater effort on behalf of teenagers to hide from authority figures. As Henry Jenkins articulates, the key issue isn't what the media are doing to our children, but rather what our children are doing with the media. Popular culture has become one of the central battlegrounds through which teens stake out a claim on their own autonomy from their parents. If adults want to protect their teenagers from engaging in problematic online behavior that could potentially damage them, perhaps they can loosen their grip, relinquish of their control, and let their children leave the house. What if we take a step back and let teenagers make the initial decision to go out with their friends or stay home and use social media? We'll be surprised by what they choose.